Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today, everyone. I'm excited to be here to speak with you. Um, the title of my talk that, that we discussed is um, Are GMOs Safe to Eat? and Other Issues Related to the Science of Genetic Engineering. Um, so uh, he already gave us a brief introduction, but I just want to talk a little bit about the organization that I'm here um, with today, which is Biology Fortified Incorporated. We are a nonprofit that's mostly funded by individual donations, so we don't take um, donations from industry or sponsor sponsorships or anything like that. And we um, really try to encourage public discussion in biology, especially um, genetics and genetic engineering in agriculture. And um, our little corn buddy here, this is Frank N. Food. Here's our blog mascot. And um, <laughs> he travels around the world and um, is sort of our, um, our, our mechanism of helping to um, encourage people to think about genetics and um, genetic engineering in agriculture in new and different ways. It really opens a lot of doors for us, which is, which is pretty awesome. Um, and if you want to learn a little bit more about what we're doing, um, please visit biofortified.org and you can see um, blog posts and resources and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then just to reiterate a little bit about me, um, I have a background in public health and um, I have a doctorate in genetics um, with a background in sustainable agriculture. And um, I'm a founder and board member of Biology Fortified. And my current day job is that I work in science policy, um, which is a good time to mention my disclaimer. Um, nothing that I say here today can be blamed on anyone but me. <laughs> so let's get right to it. Um, I'm sure many of you saw this recent poll that came out by, by <coughs> Pew. Um, and they surveyed um, AAAS scientists, and they also surveyed a representative sample of the US public. And um, they had some really interesting results for a lot of reasons. But I'm going to focus on. Um, this, uh, just a couple of the questions that they asked here. Um, so 98% of the AAAS scientists agreed with the statement that humans evolved over time. And 87% agreed that climate change was um, due to humans. Um, and then, then you can see there's a gap, you know, as expected, between what um, the scientists thought and what the general public thought. But when it starts to get to food, things get really interesting. Um, only 68% of the scientists said that it was safe to eat foods grown with pesticides. And 28% um, of the public said that that, that was safe, um, with a 40-point gap between those two. And then with genetic engineering, we get um, a pretty high consensus of scientists, 88%, um, even higher than the, than the amount of scientists that thought climate change was um, due to humans. Um, but then only 37% of the public thought that it was safe to eat. And that 51% gap in those two percentages was the highest out of all of the questions that Pew asked. So why is that? Why, why is genetic engineering so contentious compared to so many other questions? And I really think it comes down to appeal to nature. So we know food that is natural is good. We're told, eat, eat food, mostly plants. And, um, you know, we know that an apple is, is pure, it's good, it's healthy. And then food that is unnatural, like junk food, Coca-Cola, things like that, it's not good um, because it's unnatural. So um, genetic engineering is also not natural. It happens in a laboratory. And therefore, genetic engineering is not good. And that, I think, is sort of the process that all of us go through, whether we're skeptical or not. And it leads us to think genetic engineering is not good. But the problem is, is that this appeal to nature fails because food really is not natural. Even the most natural things that we eat have been modified by humans for many, many years. And in a lot of ways, genetic engineering is a natural process, <clears throat> or at least analogous to natural processes. So here are some pictures. Does anyone recognize these plants? Oh, I hear some really good guesses. <laughs> so this first one, I think I heard carrot. It is indeed uh, the ancestor of carrots, or you know, a wild relative. Um, this next one, this kind of weedy thing that looks like maybe it's dandelion-ish. Yeah, lettuce. It's lettuce. Yes, very good. Oh, this is a, I'm going to have to bring up my game. This obviously is a highly educated audience here. <laughs> um, and then this one, these weird spiky looking berries. That's the ancestor of tomatoes. 
<laughs> and then this last one, I think I heard someone say brassica. Very good, yes, um, that is the ancestor of cabbage and in fact, many other plants. So this, um, this wild mustard plant um, is, is, um, has the genus name brassica and all of these other plants are called brassicas as a group. And through many, many years of um, human-directed breeding, we've taken this one weedy little plant and turned it into so many different vegetables that can still interbreed but they're so, so um, different that they, they're, they're so different looking that they, they're speciated. And it's just sort of amazing to look at this diversity and think that all, it all came from one plant. Um, breeding is, the, is not the only way that humans have altered uh, the plants that we interact with. So I'm gonna just take you really quick through plant genetics through history. So around 8,000 BC, humans started intentionally breeding plants. So very, very long time ago. Um, in about 300 BC, we started grafting different species of plants together. And then finally, in the 1800s, we started to understand what we were doing with all that breeding. Then in the 1920s, um, cell fusion and chemical and radioactive mutagenesis, we were starting to find new and creative ways to manipulate plant genomes. In the 1930s, we harnessed hybrid vigor and started making hybrid crops. Then, um, a little bit more recently, in the 1980s, also in the, in the 70s is when it really started. Um, we learned how to insert specific DNA fragments in this thing that we call genetic engineering. Uh, and then more recently, we have marker-assisted breeding, um, thanks to the advent of um, being able to sequence um, genomes more quickly and more cheaply. And then most recently, some really exciting new technologies uh, where we can actually manipulate DNA directly uh, using molecular tools. So I'm going to talk about some of these different types of um, uh, different methods a little bit more in detail just to sort of give you an overview. I know this is kind of a busy slide, but we'll go through it um, column by column. So this column here under breeding, um, breeding has been used to change almost all of the foods that we eat, almost everything. Um, sometimes there's different species that are involved in the breeding process. I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, it does happen in nature. Obviously, plants cross and, and reproduce. Um, and the number of genes that are affected is, is huge. It's the whole genome, potentially. So you could have hundreds of thousands of genes that are affected in breeding. Um, but we don't really know what's happening. We don't know which genes, what they do, where they are in the genome. We just know that there's changes. Um, and we're only starting to understand, but because there's so much uh, change, we don't know um, exactly what's going on um, at, the, at the genetic level. Now, the results of breeding are patentable um, in the United States and many other countries and they're eligible to be um, sold as certified organic. Then we have interspecies crosses, and you might recognize uh, pluots and tangelos, and wheat as well are also um, thanks to interspecies crosses. Um, by definition, of course, they happen between species. Um, that can happen in nature, although it's a little bit more rare, um, because sometimes we have to use um, uh, chemistry to help encourage the, um, the plants to have um, uh, non-sterile offspring, and uh, a lot of times they just live in different places so they don't breed on their own. Um, but it, but it, is, it is possible to happen in nature. <laughs> um, the number of genes that are affected, again, could be hundreds, hundreds of thousands because it's across the entire genome. Um, we don't know what's happening. The result is patentable and it's eligible to be certified organic. Then we get into something a little, a little bit more complicated, which is genome duplication. We can either use um, uh, chemicals to induce um, genomes to duplicate, or um, sometimes when you take two different species and cross them together, then through, the, um, through that process, then the genome duplicates on its own. Um, and some examples are strawberry, wheat, and bananas. Um, it does, it frequently happens between species because that's one method to get, to get there. Um, it can happen in nature, um, and again, Hundreds of thousands of genes, yes? I have no idea what a duplication of a genome is. Do you get more copies of some genes? Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, strawberries are a good example. Um, I believe they're octoploids. So what that means is that wild strawberries have one functional set of chromosomes. But then through um, various breeding methods, breeders have taken those uh, natural uh, strawberries that have one set of um, chromosomes and duplicated the whole set multiple times. So it's got um, eight copies of the genome. And actually that's one of the reasons why 
Um, the strawberries you see in the grocery store are so much bigger than those little tiny wild berries that you see. It's because they literally have so much more DNA. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? So again, um, hundreds of thousands of genes, the whole genome is affected, and um, we don't know what they are, what they're doing. Um, it is patentable, and again, it's eligible to be organic, even though it's got this pretty high level of unnaturalness to it. Um, then we get to mutation breeding, um, and some examples are cow rose rice, um, some varieties of apples, and if you've ever seen the really red, uh, deep red grapefruit, those are thanks to mutagenesis as well, and many other crops too. Um, it doesn't happen between species because it's just a mutation of the existing uh, genes there. Um, it does happen in nature. In fact, mutation is how evolution happens. We have, uh, thanks to the sun and different chemicals in the environment, um, they, that's how um, the mutations can be induced in nature. Um, the genes affected, we don't know. It, it could be a couple, it could be a lot. It depends on how much of the mutagen is present and how strong it is and how much that particular plant reacts to it. So there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, the, the exact genes that are affected, uh, we don't know which ones um, unless we do further investigation. The result's patentable and it is eligible for organic. The question about it, it sounds like the mutation is something that is just happening. It's not being guided. And if that's happening, how can it be patented? Well, there's both. So sometimes people can find a mutation in the field. So if, I, if I'm growing, you know, I'm, I'm a corn breeder, so if, if I have a lot of corn and then I come across a corn plant that has some new character that hasn't been seen before and I discover it, I could potentially patent that. Um, but there's also induced mutagenesis, which is where I take seeds or embryos or, or some plant part and I bombard it with radiation on purpose or I use certain types of chemicals to cause breaks in the DNA um, and that's, you know, human-caused mutagenesis and those are patentable as well. Yep. Um, so with genetic engineering, that's the more, I guess, the, the common definition that we think of is that you're taking a gene from one species and you're putting it into something else. Um, so often it happens between species, although not necessarily. In my research, um, when I was um, at Iowa State, I was actually using corn genes to improve corn. So it was not between species, but it was definitely genetic engineering because of the processes that I was using. Um, it does happen in nature, uh, although um, in a little bit of a different way, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, the number of genes that are affected, just a few, uh, one to three, at least in the human-directed kind. Um, we know exactly what they do and where they are and what's happening. It is patentable, but it's not eligible for organic. Uh, and then the most recent type, uh, gene, gene editing, um, there are no examples of that yet, although I expect we're going to be seeing some within the next five to ten years because it's um, a lot more precise way to induce mutations effectively. Um, it's not between species. Uh, only one gene is affected because you're, you're really targeting it using molecular means. Um, we know exactly what's going on. It is patentable and probably won't be organic eligible. So just that's a quick overview of all the different technologies. I thought organic meant without pesticides. Organic, um, it means that the pesticides have to be um, naturally sourced. So um, they use pesticides, but they have to be extracted from something or down oh, in the yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, and then they, they can't use a couple of other things, like they can't use um, sewage sludge is one, and they can't use genetic engineering. It's specifically enumerated. So all of those, all of those different methods, it really comes down to it's about the DNA, whether it's happening naturally, if we're inducing it. It's all about just the DNA, um, which is just a code. It's just telling ourselves what to do, just like a computer code tells a computer what to do. Um, and we have fantastically large amounts of DNA. <laughs> um, if we, we took all the DNA in our, in, if I took all the DNA in my body and I unraveled it and put it all end to end, there would be 10 billion miles of it. <laughs> uh, about six feet in each one of my cells and each one of your cells. It's just amazing. Um, but if you think about it, it takes a lot of code for a computer to run, and we're pretty complicated too. So, yeah. I just want to really quick go, go over, you know, how, did, how does DNA work? Um, so, uh, DNA is organized into genes, and um, each, each gene starts with a promoter, and then it has, uh, the promoter is just a little sequence that tells the cells when to turn the gene on. Um, and when, when to make it go. And so it could be when it's cold, it could be when the organism is just developing or you know, different stresses, you know, things like that. Um, the coding region is the part that's actually the instructions. And then the terminator just tells the cellular machinery that's when the gene is over. 
So that's the gene altogether. Um, and then uh, through a process called transcription, the DNA uh, gets turned into RNA. Um, <clears throat> and then that's uh, the next step is where the RNA, whoops, when the RNA is translated into protein. So there is a lot of different moving pieces and cells that you know, move along the DNA and um, you know, make these processes happen. Um, this uh, diagram here is a phylogenetic tree. And so what it's showing is that all of these different organisms are related. And that's because we all have a common ancestor. I think probably most people in here accept evolution. And um, what's really exciting about this when it, when it comes to the, the genetics part is that since we all have a common ancestor, it means that we all have many genes in common. So wildly diverse yes. organisms, <laughs> um, you know, from bacteria, fungi, animals, and plants, even though we're so diverse, we have lots and lots of genes in common. And so when someone says, oh, well, we're moving one gene from one species to another, it sounds scary. But really, when you think about it, we're all coming from the same place anyway, and we all have a lot of genes in common. So what does it mean to say a human gene or a corn gene? When it comes down to it, it's all just code. <clears throat> and on top of that, there's a phenomenon called um, natural gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer. And this is my absolute favorite example. Most aphids are green, if you've seen them in your garden. But some aphids, um, a, cer a certain type of aphids, has actually taken a, um, a gene from a fungus that uh, codes for a carotenoid, which is an orange-colored pigment, the one that makes carrots and squash and other vegetables orange. Um, and it turns the aphids orange. And um, you know that was a random happenstance. Right? They took up some fungus uh, DNA in the environment, but it turns out that being orange is beneficial to them um, because it makes them look less tasty to ladybugs. So um, uh, a random happenstance, but uh, you know, it, it, it's furthering the evolution of aphids. And so this horizontal gene transfer is pretty crazily common. Um, so this is a different type of phylogenetic tree, and it's tracking a particular sequence of DNA called BOVB, and that's a, a transposon, which is basically a virus that um, has put itself into the genome of, of animals, and, or, or plants, it's animals in this case, and then can make copy, copies of itself and jump around all over the genome. And what's really neat about this BOVB sequence is that um, Thanks to this jumping around, the one the sequences of Bov B that are in more related or animals um, are not necessarily related themselves. So this little cutout here shows that the Bov B sequence in pythons is actually very similar to the one in sheep and cows. It's just crazy, just because of um, they think that maybe it's because ticks bit the snakes and then bit the the cows and sheep, something like that. Um, and then up here, the, you, you can see zebrafish and horse are, are closely related, and then you've got platypus. You, so it's totally unexpected from, from what you would think, but that's because this horizontal gene transfer naturally is happening in the environment. So when you think about it, genetic engineering, we're really just kind of mimicking some natural processes that are happening already. Um, and then I just want to really quick, um, I mentioned transposons. These are um, three different types of corn. And these, these little cutouts here that are poking out, those are all the different transposons that are present um, in these three varieties. And as you can see, even though this is, this is all corn and it's the same sequence, they all have different transposons in different places. Um, so it's, it's helping to create a lot of genetic diversity. Um, and it can actually affect change, like real change. And so here, you've got corn that is naturally purple. Um, and thanks to this transposon in inserting into this gene, it turns off that purple pigment and makes it yellow. Pretty cool. Um, so what does that have to do with genetic engineering? Well, we're taking a piece of DNA and we're inserting it into a specific place, or inserting it into a random place uh, in the genome. And so here are the two main methods. You have agrobacterium, which is a natural um, bacteria that's out in the environment. And if you've ever seen these weird lumpy leaves out there, or if you've seen a tree that has a big basketball-sized lump on the side, those are actually tumors that are induced by this agrobacterium. And it takes a piece of DNA, forces it into the genome of the host plant, and, and that DNA tells the plant, make me a, a lumpy place where I can live, and, and it makes the plant produce food for it. <laughs> so what we did is we took that tumor-inducing part out, and we can put the DNA that we want in and use that to transform the plant and get the DNA that we want inside. Um, the other the other main option is to use um, 
force to, to literally, you know, push uh, little pieces of gold into cells. The DNA um, is on those little pieces of gold. It falls off and gets integrated into the genome. And then regardless of what method you use, your integrated DNA, or your, your DNA will hopefully integrate into the chromosomes, and then you'll be able to um, grow it up into a plant. But what's important here is there's another step, and it's sequencing. So we take that plant that we grew up that we had genetically engineered, and thanks to sequencing, we can find out exactly um, where that um, DNA was integrated. So with that transposons and all the crazy movement of DNA and it's happening in nature, we don't know where those changes are or what's happening. But um, because we know exactly what sequence we're putting in, we can find out where it went, what genes it interrupted. Um, so switching gears, now that we've talked about the science a bit, <clears throat> I want to talk about regulation in the U.S. So in 1986, um, a document was published by the White House, talked about this coordinated framework for regulation of biotechnology. And basically what they said is that the risks of genetically engineered organisms are not fundamentally different from risks of similar non-genetically engineered organisms. And I think that the science supports that. Um, they said that existing laws provide adequate authority and um, the regulation should be science-based and we should regulate GE on a case-by-case -case basis. So how does that actually work in practice? Well, there's three main agencies involved, although there are many other that have different smaller pieces. The FDA checks things to see if it's safe for food and feed. Uh, the EPA checks to see if it's safe, um, if, if the pesticides that are involved, if any, are safe. And um, uh, USDA, a particular part of it called the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, um, checks to make sure that it's um, safe for agriculture and the environment. So that's obviously a little bit more complicated than that, but this is the general overview. So how does that work? How do they divide up the labor? Well, if you have an insect-resistant herbicide-tolerant soybean, APHIS has to check it to make sure it's safe for agriculture, EPA has to check the pesticides, and FDA has to check it to make sure it's safe for food and feed. If you had something like golden rice, which is rice that's engineered um, to have improved nutritional traits, <clears throat> then APHIS has to check, for, check it for agriculture, FDA checks it to make sure it's safe for food and feed, but EPA doesn't need to check it because it's not involved with pesticides. Now, if you had something like Bermuda grass for your lawn that was herbicide tolerant, um, FDA does not have to check it, but EPA does. Um, and then last, um, a blue rose, um, it's not food and it's not pesticide related, so only APHIS would need to check it if someone wanted to grow it in the United States. So that's just sort of briefly how regulation in the U.S. works. So one big question that people have is, well, how much independent research has been done to check these things? And there's a lot. <laughs> so this paper just came out um, this year, and it shows um, the cumulative number of research papers that have come out about specifically GE safety research. And as you can see, it's steadily increasing every year. Um, this particular paper looked at, um, uh, looked at peer-reviewed literature that was about allergenicity, um, animal health, animal nutrition, equivalence to see if GE and non-GE were the same, um, presence of mycotoxins, uh, processing, traceability, digestion, and other unintended effects. And <clears throat> they found 698 peer-reviewed papers with the full text available just on those subjects. Um, fewer than 5% of the, of the papers um, had negative outcomes saying that GE was not safe. <clears throat> and uh, there was an average of 44 papers per year for the past 15 years. Uh, and then when it comes to that conflict of interest part, 25% um, of the papers declared there was a conflict of interest. They were either from a, a researcher um, or had funding that was industry related. 15% um, didn't report funding information. And um, all told, at least, 50 per, at least 58% had no conflict of interest. But remember, only 5% reported negative outcomes. So it seems like there's a pretty good balance of literature from not, that's not industry related that's showing there's no negative outcomes. There could be a whole gradation of negative outcomes ranging from trivial to catastrophic. That's and true. There have already been lots of publicity of genetically engineered food blowing into other fields and getting loose and getting out in nature. And sure. So not trying to exaggerate what 5% is, but if something was really awful and it got loose, that's not a good outcome. Well... Did they, did they rate... The, the negative outcomes from, you know, zero to 100 on a badness scale. This, this paper um, particularly looked at um, 
was particularly interested in the conflict of interest piece. So I don't think that they were rating necessarily the, um, uh, the amount of badness, which I think you're right, that's very relevant because even though um, transgene flow in itself is not a harm, if it's a transgene that causes you know, harm to the environment, maybe it, an endangered species or something, and even if it's just once and it blows out into the field, it could potentially harm things, you're right. Um, and so we definitely need to look further into the literature. And um, that's kind of uh, one project that bio Biology Fortified in my organization has been interested in. So um, Gen Genera is the Genetic Engineering Risk Atlas. And if you go to, um, go to our website, you can find this. Um, and we looked at studies uh, similar to the, the previous paper. We looked at studies in our database that asked, are GMOs safe to eat? And um, we compared that with the industry or we compared that with the funding. And we got very similar results to what Sanchez did, where um, it didn't matter if the, the who, who funded the studies. What we found is that the majority of the papers, the grand majority, found that they're either safer or just as safe as non-GE foods. Um, oh, so you can go to um, biofortify.org slash genera, and you can um, actually play with the literature yourself. And we've rated things. And you can um, drill down and actually find the abstracts yourself and, and look at it. Um, and I think, just really briefly, um, there, there are a few papers that have famously shown harm uh, due to genetically engineered organisms. And um, basically, when it comes down to it, if you look at the methods and the conclusions and things like that, they don't really stand up to, to scientific scrutiny. And we can talk about that a little bit later when, when I'm done um, finishing these slides really quick. <laughs> Another one of the issues is that, um, as I understand it, is that the uh, what Gabe was talking about is the the genetic engineered corn blowing into a, a an organic farmer's field. That organic farmer now is ruined because he can't uh, he can't sell organic corn because it's not organic. Sure. So and, Mon and Monsanto sues him if he replants the corn, even if he didn't know it was genetic. So I, I, we'll go ahead and pause this. And I think those are really important questions to address. They're common, common myths. Um, so let me address this just really quick. Um, so first off, there are lots and lots of ways that farmers can use to prevent uh, pollen flow between fields. Um, and organic farmers actually have to use those methods. They're required to as part of their certification. So actual uh, transgene flow into other fields is, is fairly rare. Um, How would they put up a big wall so the wind can't blow it so, um, so, for example, my research was, was with transgenic corn. So we wanted to make sure that our experimental corn, that the pollen wasn't, you know, flying around Iowa and, you know, uh, getting our, our genes all over the place. <laughs> so uh, what we did is we grew um, border rows. We grew really, really tall corn hybrids all along the sides um, so that any pollen that was blowing out of there, it's not going to blow up and out. It's going to blow out, like over. So it blows into those those tall border rows, and the majority of is majority of it is um, caught by those plants. And there's actually a really really cool um, study that um, someone did at Iowa State also, um, where they they took some purple corn and they grew it um, with a lot of yellow corn around it, and they looked at all the ears of yellow corn and said, how much, you know, how many purple kernels can we find, and how far did it go? And it turned out it didn't actually go very far. And that's just corn. I mean, you know, different plants have pollen that are more or less heavy and, you know, different aspects. But there are ways that you can physically prevent pollen from moving. You can also temporally prevent it if we know that it takes approximately, you know, two months to get from planting to flowering, then you know your neighbor is planting the same species and you don't want cross-pollination. You just delay your planting or plant it early a couple of weeks which might be easier said than done based on environmental conditions and stuff, but that's another way you can do it. Um, and then you can just use distance. You know, let's say I'm growing corn and soy and my neighbor's growing corn and soy. I'll just make sure that my soy field is here in between our two corn fields. You know, so stuff like that. There's definitely ways that you can prevent it. So I, I don't want to neglect this question about the lawsuits. So um, Monsanto has publicly said that if there is accidental pollination, uh, or accidental uh, movement of their patented seeds onto your property, not only will they not sue you, 
they will pay to get it cleaned up. So there's, there's that. Now that's what Monsanto says. What's really happening? Well, a whole ton of organic farmers recently sued Monsanto to, to say, hey, you guys are suing us for this accidental contamination of our fields, and it's not our fault. Well, the judge said, let's look at some examples. Let's talk to these farmers who have been sued. How many do you think they had? Zero. <laughs> it got thrown out of court because they couldn't come up with any examples. So it's a hypothetical problem, but it's not actually happening. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but Monsanto has promised that it won't. And now they're, they're kind of stuck with it because the reason why that got thrown out of court is because it hasn't happened and Monsanto has publicly promised not to do it. So they're kind of really bound to not do it now. <laughs> <clears throat> the farmers you're talking about, these U.S. farmers or Canadian farmers? Which farmers are you U.S. farmers, but I would love to talk about Percy Schmeiser for just a second. <laughs> sure, sure. So, um, uh, so this doesn't really have to do with safety. This is all, you know, socioeconomic, you know, patent type stuff. But um, the qu really quick, the Percy Schmeiser story, he's a farmer in Canada growing canola. And somehow, uh, genetically engineered um, canola gets onto his property. They think maybe it was like a truck dumped it nearby or something like that. Well, anyway, he's spraying his ditches nearby his fields with, um, with Roundup. And he notices, hey, some of these uh, canola plants that I accidentally sprayed didn't die. Isn't that interesting? So what had came out in court, because you know there was this whole drawn out court case with various appeals, that he sprayed his entire field and collected the seeds that were resistant to the herbicide so he knew <laughs> that was exactly what he was doing, and he continued that in his breeding program. And then somehow Monsanto found out and said, hey, you're profiting off of our gene, which he was, admittedly. <laughs> so he had to, um, I don't think he had to pay very much, but, but it, it was found in court that it was his fault. Yeah, he, if I remember correctly, what happened was that he was, he was, held, he was held liable, but he only had to pay like $1 or something. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. The sum was, was rather small. Monsanto's not really in the, I mean, they make enough money off of legitimate, you know, reasons then to, you know, they're not going to be going after people like that, so. There are some examples of, you know, farmers getting sued, but there are examples like the Percy Schmeiser example where they were clearly intentionally trying to profit off something patented. So just like if one of us had invented something and someone else was trying to make copies of it, and we would want to say, hey, stop that. I patented that. That's my intellectual property. It's, just, it's pretty much the same concept. Can you explain this graph here? Are these position papers? Or oh, yeah, sure. That concluded that GMOs are safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's... Conventional? Um, so each one, each each single number mentioned on here is is a study. So, in, for example, there were seven government studies that found GMOs are safer than non non GMOs. And, and when we say GMOs, it was really they were studying one particular genetically engineered trait in one particular genetically engineered crop. But we're just grouping them for the sake of discussion. Um, so yeah, so um, so the majority of the studies found that they were the same as far as safety goes. Uh, some found it was safer, and then just a few found it was less safe. Yeah. Is, is it true that uh, genetically engineered uh, plants are uh, sterile? They can't, mm -mm. You can't replant the, the seeds from the... No, so there, that's a pretty interesting um, topic. So. That's, that's the farmers in India that are committing suicide because they have to keep buying the seeds every year. Well, instead of replanting the seeds, not so that, none of that's true. not exactly, not not really. And therefore, they're go they're going broke, and therefore they're killing. Them. So, um, I guess I'll, I'll start with the science, and then we'll move into the socioeconomic stuff. So, um, uh, hybrids which is a lot of the crops that we eat are, are hybrids, they don't breed true. And so the, the way that we, we make hybrids is that we take two lines and we make them as uh, genetically identical as possible within their line. And then we cross them together, and that's the hybrid. And so it, they all have one gene from this line and one gene from that line. And so the result is that the plants all grow to be the same size, they're highly identical, they have this, this thing called hybrid vigor, you know, just like if you have um, these inbred and inbred lines of dogs, we know that they have lots of problems. They've got hip dysplasia and those nose problems and all those things. It's because they're inbred. 
But a mutt, when you take two inbreds and breed it together, they're very healthy. So that same concept works for plants. <clears throat> so the problem is, though, is that if you take two hybrid plants and you cross it together, then you don't have that nice one-for-one -one genes anymore. The genes segregate out, and so you'll get some tall ones, some short ones. You know, they'll be all different types. And so farmers just, it's, it's not beneficial for them to farm, to, to replant hybrids for that reason. Some plants, some crops that we have are not hybrids, like wheat. Farmers do commonly buy a, a wheat variety and then replant it for a few years until the next good thing comes out. So it really depends on the species. Um, now with the uh, sterile seed, or sometimes it's called terminator, um, it was actually something that was, came up there theoretically and they started researching it um, as a way to prevent gene flow. So if I, if I had a transgene and I didn't want it to get you know, to be blown all over Iowa or whatever, then you know, maybe I could use some sort of mechanism to say that the pollen is sterile. So when it blows, it's not going to pollinate anything else. But for various reasons, people didn't like that idea, which is kind of frustrating because it really solves a lot of these problems of gene flow. Um, so all the research was scrapped. And actually, there is like an international um, treaty that says you can't use Terminator. So it's pretty crazy how, how, how far that went. Um, now, so just the, the situation in India, I mean, it's, it's really tragic. I mean, there's, there's no, no way to look at that and say that's not terrible. Um, but I think it's very, um, it's, it's just incorrect to blame it on one technology. So there's a lot of different ways to look at the situation. But um, in, in the U.S., we have crop insurance. We have, you know, different types of price supports, you know. We have different social services, and farmers often work outside of the home in addition to working on the farm. And so there are many protections to make sure that farmers don't go bankrupt. It still happens, though, and actually there, in, in New York in particular, there's been a rash of suicides among um, dairy farmers in New York because they're, the price of milk is too low. And anyway, that's another story, but, I mean, farming is perilous. You know, you're at the whims of nature. So um, I would say doubly or triply so in India where you don't have crop insurance, you don't have any price supports. You know, if, if there's a monsoon or whatever and your crop fails, you literally have nothing to feed your family with. Like it's, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It's just, it's so horrible. Um, and so you've got um, seed companies coming in and saying, hey, we've developed this thing that we think is going to help you. And then um, it helps a little bit. Right, so like the big one is BT cotton. And uh, BT is uh, an insect resistance gene. It prevents the cotton from being eaten by bullworms, which can be hugely successful for farmers who have a bullworm problem. But if you don't have a bullworm problem, then you don't need it, and maybe you spent more on seeds than you should have, and stuff like that, so you've got that issue. And then you also have the problem of, of all crazy things, um, counterfeit black market seed. So I might go to the market and say, okay, I know that I need to get this this BT cotton seed that my neighbor had that worked so great. So I'm going to get this. It looks good. I'm going to pay a whole lot of money for it, and I'm going to make a lot of money this year. And it turns out it was fake. So, you know, there's that issue going on. So um, there's just a whole lot of different problems. And then there's also an issue of, um, of just debt in general. You know, we can go, m most of us, if we have reason reasonable credit, we can go and get a bank loan pretty easily. That just doesn't exist in a lot of countries, um, in India and Africa. They, there's, there's just no mechanism for that. So I have to scrimp and save and do whatever I can, you know, maybe find a loan shark to get enough money to buy seeds to plant that year. And then if something happens, if I bought black market seed or there's a monsoon or whatever, um, I've lost everything and I have a loan shark out to get me. It's, I mean, it's just a terrible situation. And there are some NGOs that are out trying to help with microloans and things like that. But, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be done, a lot of problems that need to be solved. And I think that blaming it on GMOs, it's just distracting. And we're not going to get fixed any of the other problems. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm real passionate about that part, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I think this sort of falls into the GMO safety question. And that is, I worry about the fact that uh, as we have more and more monoculture because we're, you know, for example, growing the best kind of wheat everywhere and all the other varieties of wheat sort of fallen by the wayside, that, that that's actually potentially harmful to humans because we need a wider variety in the foods we eat. And also, you know, the tendency is, you know, as we continue to breed a wheat 
say, you know, that we, we breed it to produce more and more and more starch and less and less of the stuff that has, you know, other types of nutrients in it. So it tends to make us, you know, eat, you know, basically, uh, you know, a sort of a blander and, and, and more, you know, vitamin and mineral free diet than we would otherwise. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of, there's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot there, and and I don't think we can blame really any of that on GMOs. GMOs are just a tool. GMOs, been yeah. Fact, I mean, you, you could say, you know, the variety of different breeds of food plants, you know, is something that we need to nurture, and the tendency in patenting organisms and making yeah. them superior to other ones in terms of their resistance to bugs and so on, is is actually working in the opposite direction. In, in some ways, although one thing that's nice is that if, if, you've, if you've got one gene that we know makes a big difference, then you can put that in a ton of varieties and make all of those varieties more profitable. So it, it could help depending on how we use it. But um, so monoculture is an issue, definitely. And I think that when it comes down to it, it has a lot to do with um, demand. I mean, this is very demand driven. If there was a high demand for, uh, for quinoa, for amaranth, for uh, red rice, you know, all these different types of grains and more different types of vegetables, and farmers would find a way to grow them, right? So right now we get a whole lot of corn because we feed a lot of corn to animals and, you know, it just, uh, um, that's, that's our system, <laughs> right? right? We, we like a whole lot of cheap meat. And in order to get all that cheap meat, we have to grow a whole lot of cheap corn and soy. And so that's the system. Now, if, if we collectively can say, I don't really like that. <laughs> I want to see if I can find some US raised you know, amaranth or, or grain sorghum or any of these other interesting different grains and maybe cut back on our meat consumption just a, a smidge, then that'll help change those monocultures into more diverse systems. And, and personally, that's really important to me. I, I, I choose to be a vegetarian because I don't want to contribute to that, those monocultures. And if you frequently eat, eat meat and dairy, then you're contributing to that. The exciting stuff. What can, genetically what can genetic engineering do? What can it actually accomplish for us? Um, Consumer-oriented traits. Um, they, it can change the colors, flavors, it can remove allergens. There's actually um, allergen-free peanuts that have already been created. They're just not on the market yet for various reasons. Uh, they can improve shelf life. There's so many different things. Um, nutritional qualities. We can add nutrients. We can reduce anti-nutrients. We can reduce toxins. Tons of different things in that category. Pest resistance can make plants that, that are um, protecting themselves against insects, fungus, nematodes, diseases, all those different things. Nematodes. What's that? What are nematodes? Uh, they're little microorganisms in the soil that um, they're kind of like wor worm, they're wormy, you know. Harmful. They're harmful, yeah. They, they destroy roots and, you know, um, uh, they can really cause huge problems in agriculture. And the, the main way to get rid of nematodes is um, to use um, soil fumigation. And it's, it's, a, it's pretty nasty. Yeah, it's, it's highly toxic to humans, to animals, to the soil. But because it's the only way to get rid of them is to, to use that, that type of chemical. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, uh, you can have stress tolerance traits. You can have plants that are more tolerant to drought, to flood, heat, cold, salt, heavy metals. You can even develop plants that can pull heavy metals out of the soil so that you can make the soil safe again if there's been a contamination problem. Um, and lastly, there's agronomic characteristics. We all know, we've all heard about herbicide tolerance, but it's not just that, there's more things. You could potentially create plants that could fix nitrogen from the air and you wouldn't have to apply uh, uh, fertilizer anymore. It's, it's, it's the sky's the limit. If you can find a gene that does it, genetic engineering is, is a way there. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Genetic engineering could also improve crop yield, could it not? Improving yield directly is difficult. So, um, so think about, um, you know, the different genetic traits that humans have. So some of them are pretty simple. You know, eye color, you know, is only affected by a few genes. But height is affected by many genes, and that's why we see a bell curve. You know, you have discrete categories of blue eyes, brown eyes, gray eyes, you know, whatever. But there's a huge wide variety of height, and that's because it's controlled by many genes. And yield is the same way. So they're trying to find single genes that can really improve things, but that's a little bit harder. <laughs> So we can get it yield through these other things, though. If you can reduce pest pressure, then the plants can grow stronger. Um, 
So what do we actually have on the market now? That's what a lot of people want to know. So all those things are possible. OK, what do we really have? And I'm sad to say it's not super exciting, but still kind of cool. Uh, so herbicide tolerance. Uh, we've all heard about Roundup Ready. There is a lot of pros here. Um, it, uh, because of herbicide tolerance, instead of having to um, plow the fields, farmers can do one or two applications of Roundup at the right time when the, the weeds are the right size. And um, because they're not plowing as much, you get less runoff. The soil can, can grow um, better soil structure and more soil microorganisms. Um, and glyphosate is a more benign herbicide than a lot of the other ones that might be used. Cons? Evolution. <laughs> if you keep using the same herbicide again and again and again, some of the plants are going to mutate uh, and start getting away from that. And that doesn't, it has nothing to do with genetic engineering, it's just evolution. We've seen uh, herbicide resistance from a lot of herbicides way before genetic engineering ever came into the um, picture. Uh, insect resistance. Um, some of the pros are um, you could have improved yields because if the plants aren't getting eaten up, they can grow uh, better and stronger. Uh, you can reduce insecticide use, which is, I think, the most exciting improvement. And you can reduce toxic fungus. So this is just a picture of some Bt corn and then non-Bt corn. This is obviously an extreme. Not all non-Bt corn has this level of fungus infection. But <laughs> what happens is the, um, the corn borer goes in and um, you know, eats, eats little holes into the corn, and it lets the, the fungus spores in and then the fungus grows. And I've seen this in the field, it's so disgusting. Like it's wet and it's gross and not super healthy to eat, obviously. <laughs> um, and not only is it, is it you know, gross, but it's actually toxic. Um, these funguses produ produce a toxin called aflatoxin that um, can cause um, spontaneous abortion. It can you know, cause, cause brain damage and liver damage and actually death. And so this is a huge problem in places, especially if they don't have um, very good uh, dry storage for their grains uh, because this fungus grows and then people are hungry and they eat it and it causes all these health problems. So with Bt corn, you reduce that avenue uh, that the fungus can get into the plant and uh, it ends up being a lot safer for everybody. Uh, and lastly, virus resistance. It's not as widespread as the insect resistance or herbicide tolerance, but um, we have virus resistant papaya, which is really exciting. It can improve yields and reduce the need for pesticides that are used to control the insects that carry the virus around. And so this is, um, the, the one on that side is the GE papaya trees, and the one on this side are the infected non-GE ones. So you can see there's a huge difference in um, what's going on. It's just a little snippet of DNA. That's it. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about pesticide use uh, because that's a, a big concern a lot of people have. Well, what about this herbicide tolerance traits? It's causing us to use more herbicides. Not really. <laughs> so this is um, data from the USDA, and it's showing um, herbicide use from 1998 to 2008. Unfortunately, we don't have more recent data um, because uh, Congress decided to cut funding for some of these pesticide data collection programs. Thanks, Congress. <laughs> so um, uh, let's see. The, uh, insecticides one is pretty simple. It's, it's going down. Um, it, these are in parentheses. I have the slopes of all these lines. So the insecticides are going down just a little bit, a little bit of negative slope. Uh, the herbicides have gone down, even though it, you can't quite tell in that line. It's actually going down significantly. It has a negative slope of two. So um, since uh, the advent of, herb of herbicide resistant crops, there's a correlation with reduced herbicide use. Just a correlation. But I'll, my next slide, I'll, I'll discuss why it's, it's a little bit more than that. Um, uh, I just want to point out one other thing about this slide that I think is kind of interesting um, is that this, this category of other pesticidal substances has increased dramatically over um, the past 10 years uh, with a, a slope of almost five. And um, if you look at the USDA website, those other pesticidal substances are things like um, like gasoline <laughs> and um, different types of um, natural pesticides that sometimes are used in organic farming. And so there's a correlation with this increase of other, with the increase of organic farming. And again, that's just a correlation and I think it needs to be investigated further, but I find that data point to be particularly interesting. Um, <clears throat> so this is looking at uh, herbicide use on farms using herbicide tolerant crops and farms that are not using herbicide tolerant crops. In uh, 1996, before herbicide tolerant crops were widely used, you had a whole suite of different herbicides, and they were pretty toxic. The, um, 
environmental impact quotient, that EIQ there, um, the higher number, uh, that means it's more toxic, it's a, a, a compilation figure that's based on harm to humans, harm to the environment, harm, you know, uh, harm in waterways, things like that. So the most common herbicides um, were pretty nasty. Um, and they were used at a pretty high rate. Uh, and then the higher toxicity number means that you can consume more of it before there's a problem. So 700 is the safest and two is the least safe. So that um, pendimethylin um, had a very high toxicity and a long half-life. It's, it's not good. <laughs> but thanks to herbicide-tolerant crops, farmers were using much more glyphosate. 85% of all their herbicides used on their farms, 85% compared to just 15% before herbicide-tolerant crops came about. And as you can see, the EIQ is lower. They're applying it at about the same rate. Uh, and then it also has uh, about half the half-life as some of these other more toxic chemicals. So overall, glyphosate is actually quite safe, uh, especially when it's used in a safe manner um, in a, um, uh, you know, with, with proper training. So I think that this really, it takes this... this um, what are the units on the half-life? Oh, I've got that somewhere. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, it's probably days, I would imagine. Um, glyphosate, uh, it binds to um, minerals in the soil and is degraded. So it, it, it's pretty, um, it goes away fairly quickly. Um, so what, what, what that does is it takes that, you know, correlation that we, we know that more herbicides are, there was a decrease in herbicides over the time that use of herbicide tolerant crops was increasing. And then here we've got the proof that shows it's not just correlation, it's actually causation. There is a direct impact uh, thanks to the herbicide tolerant crops. And unfortunately, because they worked so good, they were the victim of their own success. So um, because farmers use so much glyphosate, now we're seeing the impact of these herbicide resistant weeds, but that's kind of another subject. Um, so what's actually on, our mar on the market right now, um, if you have dairy, uh, there's herbicide tolerant alfalfa that is fed to dairy cattle. We have um, herbicide tolerant canola, which is made into oil. Um, herbicide tolerant and insect resistant uh, corn, which is made into oil, processed foods, and fed to livestock. Uh, there's a little bit of herbicide tolerant or, in or um, insect resistant sweet corn, but it would be probably pretty unlikely you'd actually find it. Uh, it's not very common. Um, there's herbicide tolerant and or insect resistant cotton, which is used for oil, fiber, and livestock feed. Virus resistance in papaya and crookneck squash, although the squash is fairly rare. Um, then you have soybean uh, that's herbicide tolerant or, and or insect resistant, which is used for oil and livestock feed, although the varieties that are used for tofu and edamame are generally not genetically engineered. Uh, and then lastly, there's sugar beet, which is made, for or made into sugar and um, fed to livestock. So again, the, there is, you, unfortunately, we only have those three traits right now, herbicide tolerance, insect resistance, and virus resistance. Uh, but that's not all. Coming out onto the market, just recently approved by the USDA, uh, we have um, non-browning potatoes and non-browning apples. And these traits, it, it might not look like much. You might think, ah, how is this going to affect me? You know, maybe it'll help you in your kitchen a little bit if you could buy these. You know, you could cut up the kids' apples the night before, then they wouldn't look yucky the next day. Uh, you could cut up your potatoes for mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving the day before, and you could you know, just go ahead and get things going. So there's a little bit of, of consumer benefit there, but really where these matter is food waste. Um, so if um, you know, someone's mass producing french fries for a restaurant, you know, and there's gonna be um, uh, brown, browning from cutting and also um, bruising, um, these traits will help reduce that and you'll end up with a more attractive product and you'll eliminate some of that food waste, which is kind of cool. And then um, with the potato, acrylamide is a uh, chemical that is naturally present in um, potatoes and other foods when they're heated at really high temperatures, such as with frying or broiling. Um, levels of acryl acrylamide can go up and there's some indication that acryl acrylamide could be associated with certain cancers. So this is a, a safer potato if it turns out that eating acrylamide really does cause cancer, which it's not definitive right now, but it wouldn't harm us to get rid of it, that's for sure. <laughs> Just quick, the, the apple, mm -hmm. I guess I wouldn't ask it about the potato, but the apple, does it, non-browning, does that mean- The picture's not that so hot. It's, it's not 
oxidizing or, or you don't know that it's oxidizing, it's hiding? Um, so it's not oxidizing. So it, there's an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase, which um, uh, turns, I don't remember all the chemistry, uh, it turns a, a chemical that's naturally present in potatoes and apples into this brown pigment. And the genetically engineered version just gets rid of that enzyme. So it's still, it still rots, you know, if, it's, if there's microorganisms present, you know, and things like that, it's still going to go bad. It's just this attractiveness piece goes away. But the other thing that's kind of cool is that the, um, they also seem to be a little bit more pest resistant because removing the polyphenol oxidase means that you have more of that uh, precursor molecule that apparently has some sort of pest resistance properties. So it has that side benefit, but I guess it's not enough for them to be advertising it. Um, yeah. So that's the end. <laughs> so we're, we can move on to questions in just a second. Um, the summary is that most food is unnatural. That, that appeal to nature doesn't work. <laughs> We've shown pretty definitively, I think, that the food that we eat, humans have interfered with it pretty thoroughly. Um, we know that genes move around in nature all over the place in unexpected ways where we've got genes moving from snakes into cows um, thanks to transposons, which means genetic engineering as just as natural as many natural processes. And the GE foods that we have are extensively tested and highly regulated. Um, and there hasn't been shown to be any uh, harm to humans or the environment. And that's it. <laughs> Bring on the questions. I don't know if this story of there was a potato developed by some university maybe 20 years ago. It was going to have some really nice thing like drought resistant, maybe resistant to some thing that damaged potatoes, like mm -hmm. some blight. And they weren't looking for this, but they were just about ready to put it out there on the market. And someone discovered that it was so high in selenium that it would actually be, have, would have been dangerous to human health. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? I don't think that had anything to do with genetic engineering. I think it was just breeding. I know that breeding, there are definitely a couple of examples of accidental increasing of things that are bad. So the other example that people frequently talk about is um, increased sorolins and in celery. Uh, sorolins are a chemical that um, when it gets on our skin, it can um, cause us to be sensitive to the sun. Um, and so when you're trying to breed for more pest resistance, a lot of times, I mean, I mean plants produce insecticides and, and herbicides and, you know, they, they're not just sitting there being benign, they can't run away. So they make all these chemicals to kill everything around them. <laughs> um, and some of those things are good for us and some of those things are bad for us. And you know, I think that when, we, when we're not very careful, we can accidentally breed, breed for those chemicals. Um, the question I have is, is um, and, and I think that in terms of safety of genetic modification versus natural, whatever that means, foods. Uh, natural just has one thing. It, it's, it's a slower process, so there's time. But with genetic engineering, it seems like we're making very active changes at a very, at a very high rate, mm -hmm. and then deploying them, and then we're deploying them out to large numbers of people or, or across the large population very quickly. Um, and I, I think that that you know, on, on an individual level, it's probably the same as breeding. But, but, what do you think the impact of that very rapid change of pace and the fact that genetic engineering is is, is going to go to the active gene sequences much more precisely than than breeding programs are is going to be? Well, I mean, yes and no. You know, if I'm if I'm using marker-assisted breeding or mutagenesis or whatever, and I know that I've got a character that I want to change. I can change it, you know, as long as it's within the natural genetic variability of the, the, the plant um, or its relative. <laughs> um, so on an evolutionary time scale, we're making changes without genetic engineering very quickly. Um, and genetic engineering still has to go through a lot. So in, in the process, you know, it's, it's more than just taking a, mu a, muta a mutagen, changing a gene and putting it on the market, or taking a gene gun and inserting the sequence you want and putting it on the market. No, both of those have to go through additional levels of breeding, like 10 years worth. 
So it doesn't go right on the market so fast. There's a whole lot of additional processes that have to go to put it into an elite background to make sure it's going to be good for farmers and to test it extensively and make sure it performs in other environments. So there's, so there's that. So I would say that as far as that risk goes, it's probably equivalent. But when it comes down to it, yeah, we are taking, let's say, um, you know, you've got some wild variety and you know, maybe we were eating that when we were hunter-gatherers. And then there's this change and where we've said, oh, this is really cool. We're going to put it out in the marketplace at huge, huge levels, right? Market saturation. Um, well, yeah, if, if, a, if a tribe of hunter-gatherers uh, 25,000 years ago discovers mutation and said, ooh, this tastes good, and then two weeks later they all drop dead from it, <laughs> we've lost one tribe of hunter-gatherers. I think that what it comes down to is, is there a plausible risk hypothesis? You know, can, can we come up with something and say, you know, there really is some reason we can think of a science-based reason why this would be inherently more risky. Well, and that's the other thing. Science tends to drift towards what's the most likely explanation and runs with it. But engineering tends to kind of say, well, this is less likely, but wow, the impact is so much greater. We're going to assume it's true, even though I know this is more likely because, because that's worth, you know, and I, I look at some of the studies and I'm wondering, is there, has there really been a sophisticated risk analysis done? I mean, what are the risk models that we're looking at? That's a really good question. And I think, I think we have to look at what is being done, not just in the U.S., but in regulatory agencies all over the world. And uh, some of them have more sophisticated risk models than others. Well, I'm not going to point any fingers at anybody, but, but Canada's is actually kind of interesting. Their risk model is that any new character needs to be looked at. What, no matter how it was developed. They, they want to take a look and, and check it and see if it's OK. In practice, they haven't actually looked at very many mut mutant crops because we know that those have been around for years and years. But at least in theory, you know, I think that's a really interesting way to look at things. Um, but as far as a plausible risk hypothesis that the process of genetic engineering would be somehow fundamentally different than all of these other methods and natural processes that I described, I don't really see that, that hypothesis being there. Isn't this really more of an objection to biotechnology in general rather than genetic engineering specifically? I know that Monsanto, for example, has these chipper systems mm -hmm. where they can do natural breeding of a plant in many lines simultaneously, orders of magnitude faster than they used to by chipping off a little DNA fragment of each seed before the plant is planted. And yeah. then they grow that, and if it has a useful trait, they sequence that chip that they see. These are pretty, it's pretty amazing technology. I've seen it at work. Yeah, they, they, um, they, they basically have every individual seed barcoded, and, and they know exactly what the sequence is, and they can tell you which seed is in which spot in the field. And if it grows a certain way, then they'll keep the seeds from that plant and move that forward in their breeding program. Yeah, and that's... And, you know, that, a lot of that's done without any genetic engineering nope. at all. It's just... In fact, because of the consumer pushback against genetic engineering and the fact that our regulatory system moves pretty slowly, there's a big incentive for companies to focus on those other breeding technologies and move away from genetic engineering, even though genetic engineering is in a lot of ways much more precise than those other technologies. <laughs> in, in the category of there are threats everywhere, I've been reading lately that rice is full of arsenic and you have to yeah. be careful. Yeah. Is that something that would lend itself to genetic engineering? to reduce the arsenic uptake into Potentially. rice. Anybody, anybody looking at that? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would be really surprised if there wasn't. But I mean, it would, it would be pretty easy. There's, you know, in the roots, there's probably some sort of transporter that binds to arsenic and carries it into the plant. Just get rid of that transporter and you're good to go. Right, so, I mean, I'm sure there, you could fix that. The question is, is there incentive to do so? And in the current marketplace, there's not. We, we live in a pretty harsh climate for these technologies right now. I'm, I've, I'm, I'm a little down on things, I guess. It, it's sort of depressing, a, a little anecdote. So when, when I was doing my research in grad school, um, I became really aware, I guess, of this problem of iron deficiency. Um, iron deficiency is the, the biggest, the, the most widespread deficiency in the world. And um, if you don't have enough iron, um, especially for pregnant women and young children, um, you can be stunted for life. You can have your, your brain never develops properly. You know, so we've got generations of people that are not meeting their potential simply because they don't have a vitamin. That's an incredible travesty to me. So in, um, in my research, we took uh, a gene from corn 
that um, is, the, is very similar in structure to um, hemoglobin in animals. And crazily enough, all plants and a lot of bacteria have hemoglobin that functions almost the same way. It can, it can bind to um, a structure that holds, a piece of, holds an iron molecule in it. So um, we increased the levels of iron in corn, and that was our research project. And the, and the goal was, well, if you could give people the seeds, they could replant them for generations and breed it into the local varieties, and everybody would have more iron, and it would be great because... Well, what was the iron in um, an absorbable form? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That, that's a really good point. Yeah, so there have been other attempts to increase iron, but, like, you know, you might look at your cereal box and it says, oh, 70% of your daily vitamins were iron, but it's barely digestible, <laughs> so you're not actually getting any of it. But heme is the most highly digestible. That's why um, uh, when you eat red meat, that's the, that's the most ideal form of iron um, because it's, it's easily absorbed into your body. So that's why we were focusing on that particular molecule instead of just breeding for high iron, because if you just breed for high iron, it, it doesn't necessarily result in digestible iron. Yeah, right, right, you should be eating spinach, which unfortunately doesn't grow everywhere. So, um, or bread fruit, yeah. Dried fruit. Dried fruit, yeah. Really? So, because it's concentrated. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I'm, you know, doing this stuff and I'm getting really excited and we're getting some promising results. And then I started doing some research on, you know, what would it take for us to bring this to market and actually, like, get it to Africa and, or um, Central America, where they have similar problems where um, corn is a staple. And um, I realized that the last time a public, uh, pro yeah, publicly funded project had made it to market was the genetically engineered papaya, which was like 20 years ago. And the likelihood that anybody would give us enough money to do all of the necessary testing and all of the necessary breeding to actually get it to market was pretty low. And I don't work in, I'm not a lab scientist anymore. <laughs> I, left, I left science to move into public policy because I felt like if, if there was any way I could help change things, um, I want to make it easier for scientists to get their, their work to the public. So it's hard right now, but maybe someday it'll be easier. <laughs> um, regarding monoculture, does genetic, well, my understanding is that, that monoculture proposes a risk to whatever type of crop it is. Absolutely. If you only have one type of corn in the world, then all the corn in the world is more susceptible to going extinct because if an in insect or something develops yeah. and it's that type of corn, yeah. then, then oh. all the corn is wiped out. Whereas so if you have a diversity, it's, it's so does, uh, then, then it's more hard. It looks more monoculture than it really is. And, and guess. does genetic engineering practices as a whole promote diversity or promote monoculture? I would say it doesn't, it's kind of irrelevant, honestly. So, you know, we might look out in some of our landscapes, you know, particularly in the Midwest, um, and see oceans and oceans of corn and you know, seas of um, soybeans. But um, just really quick, it's, it's more diverse than it looks. So farmers are pretty smart. Most of them have at least a bachelor's degree, so many of them have masters, um, believe it or not. Um, and they know better than to put all their eggs in one basket. And so they're constantly testing new varieties. So they're never going to plant their whole farm with one variety of corn. They're going to you know, maybe have you know, 20 or 30 different types. So they're growing in different places, and they're using GPS and all sorts of different modern technology to figure out exactly which varieties grow best and which type of, you know, is it you know, the, the slightly more flooded land does this variety better, and the higher land does this variety better. And so they're always experimenting with different varieties. Um, so. It looks worse than it is, um, and I would say that genetic engineering is kind of, kind of irrelevant as far as that aspect goes, because um, most of the seed companies will have a non-GE and a G GE variety that, you know, of the same. They're the same variety, but they, you can buy the seeds with the trait or without the trait. Um, although there is an issue somewhat where the traits have, the traded seed has been so popular that it's more difficult to buy the non-GE seed. You have to request it in advance and it's a little bit harder to find. But now that more farmers are buying non-traded seed for various reasons, partly because we've done such a good job of getting rid of the, core, the, um, the insects that are susceptible to, B, to BT, they're starting to go extinct. <laughs> so farmers are like, oh, we don't have to plant the BT stuff anymore. So um, there's some interesting things going on there. 
so the seed companies are responding to their market and providing those, uh, uh, their, um, the non-GE uh, seeds are becoming more available again. So, yeah. What is, what's your opinion on uh, food, uh, GMO food labeling? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask about labeling. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, just like everything I've said, you know, today, this is just my personal opinion. It's not, you know, anybody's official stance. But um, I think that having more information about your food is good. You know, I really think it's awesome when I go and I buy something maybe at a farmer's market or some of the local stores and I can see, you know, where something was grown or, you know, what, what different practices the farmer uses. Sometimes you'll even be able to go to somebody's website and it'll tell you about their practices. You know, maybe they're excited about their cover crop that they grew. You know, I interact with a lot of farmers on Twitter and Facebook and that type of stuff. I love it. I love all that data. But I would be really uncomfortable telling anybody you have to have specific information uh, on, on this that isn't directly related to safety. You know, so we have nutrition information and we have information about allergens uh, on products that's mandated. But does it make sense to mandate that, uh, that someone would label something that we just showed isn't significantly different? Um, now, the FDA does require a label for something if it is significantly nutrition, if it has a significant difference nutritionally. So, like, if we ever did get golden rice or something like that in the U.S., then it would have to be labeled, um, you know, increased levels of vitamin A, uh, something like that, uh, because you don't expect rice to have vitamin A in it. Um, but um, I think, so I mentioned a little while ago that I'm a vegetarian. And sometimes it can be really annoying to try to track down information about whether or not a particular product has an additive because, you know, certain, because um, companies can choose, you know, something that's made from plants or something that's made from animals and it's pretty much equivalent and so they'll put, this, put it in their product. And so, but they might not label which one it is. And so I have to call them up or look on their website or find some other <coughs> vegetarian has already figured this out and, you know, to, you know, if I really want to try hard to avoid it, sometimes I just get lazy. But, um, you know, so it would be really cool if it was mandated, you know, this product may contain meat. But I know there's no safety difference. And I know that that could potentially increase costs because um, if a company has the freedom now to say, well, I've got two equivalent products, one is sourced from animals, one is sourced from plants, I can choose whichever one's cheaper right now to put in my product. But if, I'm, if I have to choose in advance, you know, whether or not I want this meat label or not, you know, then it's, it's constraining my ability to create a safe product that, you know, has the lowest cost for the consumer. So, it, it, I mean, it's, it's forced speech, effectively, and I don't feel comfortable with that. Well, well forced speech, as Michelle has, um, there, there's questions of accuracy and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, um, but, um, but uh, so far the, the courts have supported factual reporting as a constitutionally allowed form of force. Oh, sure. Um, but the thing is, is for what you're talking about, they, they don't, they can just pretty much get away with may contain animal products. And that's the end of it, I mean. Right, and actually, you're, that is a fantastic point. Let me, let me take that just a little bit further. So, as a vegetarian, I, I want to know if products contain meat. So, but if companies are just like, well, it's probably cheaper for me to just put a label on there that says, may contain meat. Well, that was the default anyways, right? If I have an unknown processed food, like crackers or whatever, that might, might have a you know, lard in it or something that might not be labeled or whatever, um, this is the default. It, it already is may contain. So if I really care, I still have to call out the company or find the website or whatever. Well, and it's the same thing with genetically engineered uh, products. The default for processed foods, if it contains canola, corn, or soybeans, it may contain GMOs. In fact, it probably does. Um, but, um, you know, you can find many processed food options that say no GMOs, either through a third-party certification or they, it's organic. Because, you know, if it, says, if it sa says it's organic, then it doesn't contain GMOs. So the, um, your ability to buy alternative products is already out there. So if we mandate that people have to disclose, and, and companies would probably take the lazy route and say may contain GMOs because they're not going to test. They're not going to, you know, no one's going to definitively say, yes, this definitely contains GMOs when they can get, get away with it may contain because it's a lot easier to say may contain. Um, so, but it, 
if you are trying to avoid it, it doesn't give you any more information. And if you don't care, it's making, potentially making your food more expensive for no reason. <laughs> Relating to the question of safety and um, safety testing, uh, one of the areas that I, I thought was interesting and in what I've read about uh, GM plants in the past has to do with because there's a reduced number of genes changed in a GE plant, your potential uh, different things that you have to test from a safety perspective can be constrained and more focused. And I think there was an example of something that uh, borrowed a Brazil nut gene. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know that story? I do. I do know that story. That's a good one. So um, it's standard for genetically engineered uh, um, plant products that the developer is going to uh, put it through all kinds of allergenicity testing. They're going to look and see, you know, are are there any um, any genes involved that could, you know, is the transgene that we're putting in does that gene look anything similar to the genes for any proteins that we know are allergens? You know, and then they're also going to, you know, do other various tests. They're going to see how much does that, how quickly does that protein degrade? Because we know that. Proteins that degrade more slowly might have more likelihood to become an allergen just because it's got longer time to react in your body. And there's different things like that um, that are established tests that are done for all genetically engineered products. And so uh, this Brazil nut example is one where they caught it because of the, the testing that was voluntarily done. And so um, it was a gene from Brazil nut that they were putting in soy, and I think it was yield. I think they were trying to increase yield. Um, and they... Brazil nut was probably a bad choice because we know a lot of people are allergic to Brazil nuts. But in the natural course of testing, they found, oh gosh, the particular protein that we chose is one of those proteins that causes the allergy. And so that project was scrapped. So I guess a little success story. <laughs> is genetic engineering likely to have any effect on the cost of products? I mean, right now, you pay more for something certified organic. Um, does genetic engineering have the prospect of reducing prices, raising prices, no effect, or just varied across what they're going to genetically engineer? Yeah, that's a good question about whether, whether or not GE could affect consumer pricing. I think that most of the time it decreases it, and sometimes it could increase it. So in the case of increase, if, if there is a specialty product, so um, there's a particular soybean oil that has um, higher levels of, um, what is it, the... ALA versus DLA or whatever, whatever the healthy version is, there's a genetically engineered soybean oil that is healthier. And um, so if it turns out there's a good market for those because everybody wants the healthier oil, maybe they can charge a premium. So in that case, maybe it would be higher, which would be good for the farmer because they'll be able to get more for their product. Yeah, yeah, LZL, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so that's kind of cool. There, it's not widely available on the market yet, but it should be uh, as far as I, if I recall correctly, it's already been approved, so it's just sort of, they're just waiting to see if, if the market will want it. Um, but in most cases, I would say it decreases costs because most of the traits out there are ones that affect the farmer. So if I've got traits that help make farming easier for me, then it's cheaper for me to produce products. And so if it's cheaper for the farmer to grow it, more farmers will grow it, so there's more on the market, so the price goes down. It's just basic economics. Um, so for the most part, these uh, farmer-oriented traits do help produce uh, food that is cheaper. Although we're feeding most of it to animals. <laughs> so what, what benefit we have there, are, you know, it's debatable. <laughs> Thank you very much. So